right. So thank you all for joining us today. We're really excited to have um, an in-conversation program hosted by the Wisconsin Museum of Quilts and Fiber Arts. This is In Conversation with Dagmar Plank, Joan Kennedy, and Gina Stadelska. What's really fun for us about this is these are three local artists that are right here in Ozaki County, well, Ozaki and Washington counties. Um, but it's nice to have some that are really close uh, by here too, um, and be able to hear their perspective on what's going on and what their art is. So we do offer these programs from the museum for free. We greatly appreciate donations. You can make donations at our website. Otherwise, we are also posting the link in the chat feature. And you are welcome to ask questions about um, any of the artwork that you see. Ask the artist questions. You can do that using the chat feature. We are monitoring Facebook. So if you're posting a question to Facebook, we will see that question too. We're really excited to have all of you join us. And with that, I'll do real brief introductions of the people that are joining us today, and then we'll dig right in. So I'm Melissa Ralstead, I'm the museum's executive director, and I am joined today by three amazing artists. Um, so Joan Kennedy. Joan is a fiber artist working to translate the natural world into fiber art. She developed her signature techniques through experimentation, continually learning about the natures of her materials, things like uh, reclaimed knitted wool fabrics, wool yarns, fabric dyes, and how they behave when felted. She is, has mostly functional art that celebrates self-reliance and a joy of creating and using individually handmade articles. She also honors the millions of women who came before her, most notably her mom, um, her mother and her grandmother, who passed down their handwork skills and the tradition of creating beautiful functional items essential to their daily lives. And then we're also joined by Gina Stadelska. Um, in Gina's work, she endeavors through her personal history with fiber to weave and stitch together the memories of all women who have come before her, who clothed, wrapped, warmed, mended, and adorned others. Natural dyeing and the use of found objects infuse her work and further honor the ideals of fiber artists throughout time. And for Gina, echo printing um, is a, a part of what she's doing. It infuses some of her work and it's also a contemporary extension on the traditions of natural dyeing. So look forward to hearing more, a little bit more about that. And then Dagmar Plank is an artist also working with fabric and other fibers to create textile pieces that reflect her history over um, a fabric constructions for over 20 years. She started out with traditional quilt making, but soon discovered the joys of dyeing her own fabrics, creating her own quilt designs, and for the past three years, following her retirement from a career in social work, she has been a full-time studio artist. She likes to think of herself as a mark maker with fabric and thread, an explorer of color, line, and texture as she strives to discover new connections with her inner and outer world. So again, ladies, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. And for those of you tuning in, um, these artists are, you know, being so generous and giving of their time. So you know, we really appreciate them being willing to share and take the time out of their days and their lives to put these programs together for us and then to, you know, have what I hope is a really fun chat. So thank you all for, for joining us today. Now with that, um, my first question for you, I, you know, I did a real brief background, but can you tell us a little bit more about yourselves and how you got started as an artist? So Joan, we'll start with you. <laughs> okay. Well, I've, I've been a maker all my life, um, but I have just come to uh, be consider myself a full-time artist in the past 10 years or so. Um, I struggled seeing myself as an artist because I've never um, had any inclination toward drawing or 2D work, and it's only recently I realized I'm a sculptor. Um, and um, so I um, finally got the time to think and had the space to make my art when my kids both went off to college. And after, you know, a, a lifetime of experiences and studying art and learning about art, practicing different fiber skills, um, I was at a point in my life where I decided just to really focus on what I knew and limit my techniques and just push them forward so that I um, 
just could see where, where they would take me rather than trying all the different type of media that I had been trying. And um, I developed my vision and developed my techniques and um, started doing art fairs, which is where I started meeting my, um, my peers. And here I am today. <laughs> Do you know what about you? Well, um, I have a background in uh, fine arts, um, um, but it started actually in my family as well. Uh, my mom was very creative. My mom and my grandmother, like many of our grandmothers, were fiber artists. They knit, crocheted, sewed, and, um, and you know, actually even uh, allowed me to go to art lessons for a while outside of school, which was pretty cool. Um, and then I attended UW-Whitewater and got my degree in art education. And um, I taught for the uh, Grafton School District for 34 years. And um, um, my, my um, specialty in college was fiber and craft. And um, had a wonderful mentor there, Catherine Crossman. Crossman Gallery is named after her. And um, I did a lot of fiber art. I also did a lot of um, art metal. And at the time in the 70s, um, Mary Lee Hu, I think her name is, and Arlene Fish were, Fitch were doing some really groundbreaking work with um, art metal using fiber art techniques. And I thought that was just the coolest thing ever, but you know, you needed to have a studio to do fiber art. And the more I worked with metal, I still really think it's neat and it's really, I love it, but um, it's just not the same, the tactile, Part of it is just not the same as fiber. So I eventually just really started focusing on fiber art. Um, but when I started teaching, wasn't teaching fiber art really, I was teaching high school art and we got to do a little bit of it. We block printed maybe on textiles a little bit, but it really wasn't a great fit for that. And I ended up teaching photography and it kind of went by the wayside. Um, I had a group of fiber art friends, um, actually met Catherine Bailey, who is the master weaver that teaches for the museum um, in a yarn shop up in Fort Washington in the 70s. Um, uh, Mary Carini was the owner and we put together a portside weavers group and, um, you know, did that for years, joined the Cedar Regardus Guild and, um, you know, that all kind of came to a halt when I had um, two kids 10 years later. and. Um, teaching full-time and kids, I kind of let that go to the wayside. And um, in the meantime, I started teaching photography as our department needed that. And um, I really came a little bit further away from it. Um, fortuitously, my son went to college in um, the Twin Cities and it's a long trip. So I picked up my knitting needles and started knitting and um, really remembered how much I enjoyed fiber art. And a couple of years ago, my husband put together my loom, which was in the basement. And I mean, it all just started coming back. And um, one of my coworkers, Laura Stone, and I went to the arts mill. I'll try to wrap this up. Um, um, she kind of gave me a nudge and um, got me going. And we both signed up for studio space at the arts mill in Grafton. And I'm still a studio artist there. So it's really, and Fibers has kind of just followed me along and realized how much I still loved it. And so now that's what I do primarily. Um, and so that's kind of my story and that's where I am now. So hey, I met a lot of neat people at the fiber, um, at the quilt museum along the way. And what about you, Dagmar? Um, well, I grew up in post-war Germany, and so working with fiber was a necessity, not a luxury. So my grandmother was actually an apprentice seamstress and an accomplished knitter, as was my mother. So I, I was around sewing and knitting and crocheting, you know, my whole life, really, my, during my childhood. And then I, I learned how to knit when I was six years old. So. <laughs> that goes a, a while back and I, I used to sew my clothes um, and you know did a little bit of fashion sewing um, but then I entered a career in social work 
and really didn't do anything with fiber until I discovered traditional quilts. And I just really, really loved them. And I wanted to make them. And I made attempts and they were just terrible because I could never make the points meet. So I was at a juncture here whether to give it up or whether to try something different. And fortunately, I discovered fabric dyeing at that point. Um, I read a book uh, by, or an article, I think it was by Jan Maya Newberg, who is a well-known dyer. And so I started dyeing my own fabric. So one, one thing led to another. I went into, from cotton to silk and, you know, how these progressions go. And then all of a sudden I had so much fabric that I didn't know what to do with. And so I decided to start selling it. And I started going on the quilt show circuit, you know, doing quilt shows all over the country. Um, of course, I needed samples for my fabric. So then I had to make some quilts. And I, I decided to just my, make my own designs just throw things together <laughs> and somehow somehow it worked and then I, uh, I stopped that and I went back to work for a number of years um, but since but I never stopped quite making quilts so um, one of my early series uh, actually started about I don't know maybe 20 years ago and off and on I've always been working on my art like Joan, thank you for saying that, Joan. I never thought of myself as an artist until about maybe 10 years ago. Um, and uh, I, I gained confidence and I decided to just do my thing, regardless of what the trend is, regardless of what other people are doing, um, that it was just for me. If I never got exhibited anywhere, that would be okay. It was my own, it is my own journey, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So that's where I come from. So one of the things, just looking at some of the art, and I, you know, I'm at least uh, somewhat familiar with all three of you, but nature and the world around you seems to be a real inspiration and really infuses the works of, of all three of you. What is it about the natural world that speaks to you and how and why have you incorporated it incorporated it into your work. So Joan, do you want to start again? <laughs> okay. Well, you know, for me, being in the natural world is like a whole immersive um, experience. And um, I'm there. Okay. I'm technical, technical issues here. Um, when I'm outside, there, you, you've got the birds, you've got the um, the air, the wind, everything, it's a completely um, exhilarating experience for me. I, my earliest memories of the outdoor, of, um, from childhood, are being outside. I, I just realized that as I was thinking about this question earlier is, I really don't have a lot of memories of being inside. Um, and I think having come from that generation where you went outside to play, you were part of nature. And I think all these experiences, um, playing with flowers and taking them apart and seeing how they were made were some of the things that I did, have become part of me. And I was also a suburban kid. So part of my experience was um, sidewalks and fences and where the plants grew in conjunction with those. Um, I also remember seeing, uh, going on a vacation, and I didn't realize the significance of it at the time, but it was in the 60s, and we um, went to Aspen, Colorado, and it was at a time when it was wilderness, and we drove up the mountain in a Jeep, uh, not on roads, but on tracks, and um, it just blew my mind, because as a suburban kid, I didn't know this existed. So... Um, nature ha always had a profound um, uh, effect on me. Um, and as my life went on, I did more, uh, I did gardening and hiking. And um, then as I started my, um, my work, I've realized that those experiences just come out in me. I've got, you know, you can see the, the dandelion purse 
um, is, you know, dandelion growing against a brick wall or the, the hostas, um, which actually here is seen in a good friend's garden um, because it was inspired by some of the, the plants in her yard. Um, when I first started doing my work um, that I'm doing now, we lived on a wooded lot and the leaves of the trees surrounded my sewing room so that you, um, uh, the, the leaves that I saw in the flickering sunlight just came out in my work and became a, like a signature of my work. Um, but also my, well, the suburban experience crept in, but I also do um, abstract um, pieces that are inspired by nature, but not directly um, uh, literal, um, a literal expression. The handbag is was inspired by ripples along the river. Um, the uh, scarf is, a, it's a cashmere scarf and it um, is kind of an, a leaf shape inspired by leaves. Um, I call them flames, but a lot of people especially if it's a green scarf, we'll see it as leaves. Um, something else that has um, come out in my work, I've been starting to make um, non-wearable work. And this particular piece was inspired, um, it's about the emerald, emerald ash borer um, and the destruction of the ash trees in our area. Um, particularly the um, city of West Bend took down all of the ash trees on the boulevards as kind of as a, a preemptive move to stop the spread, but it was heartbreaking seeing just streets lined with tree stumps. Um, so it, I started living with these, the thoughts of this um, about, I don't know, it was at least five years ago. Um, and it took me a while to figure out how to express my ideas on this. But in completing the work, what I, um, I did research into the life cycle of the emerald ash borer, and I included in this um, the, the life cycle. You can see there, if you look closely, there's, there's some beetles in there. There are some eggs being laid. You've got the um, larvae themselves um, forming around underneath the bark. Um, so natural systems find their way into my work too. So it's, uh, get rid of this picture here, there, okay, I'm back. So anyway, so those are, uh, that's me and nature. <laughs> Gina, what about you? You alluded to it in your introduction. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I think some of it's generational and, and lifestyle. Um, because we too, you know, you went outside in the morning and you played outside all day and right. we did a lot of collecting pine cones and sticks and mm -hmm. um, interesting things and you'd bring them home. And, um, you know, I find that that happens a lot too. My mom was a bird lover. Um, my sisters and I are all bird lovers. We've passed that along to our children. You know, I think that's something that you do. It's, a, it's kind of a gift you give um, your family, I believe. Um, I'm going to try to show you this is um, not good. Um, this is a little peek at my studio um, in Grafton, but this is what I was going to show. This is um, just the way that nature is infused in my work. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the eco printing later, but you can see it's part of the the fabric that's used in the textile collage, um, whether it's a natural dye being used or an, a direct print um, of nature, you know, leaves and pods. But then I also really like, I guess I like the textural quality, I like the contrast, um, I like the dimension that something three-dimensional gives. So not always, but often um, you'll see something real from nature, you know, in my work, whether I'm couching um, down a, a seed pod or, or a stick or twig or um, using, and I'm going to say farmed feathers because I know there are laws about feathers in artwork, so I want to make sure everybody knows that. Um, you know, whether I'm stitching that down or um, however it might be used. Here's another one where it's a, a dogwood twig 
And I looked at them all without those pieces and um, it just brings something to it, that tangible, another layer, uh, another reel, you know, and another hint at what you're actually seeing. You know, um, not everybody is um, familiar with eco printing and I think people assume that that's fabric that's bought, but most of the fabric that I use, not all of it, but most of the fabric I use as some sort of mark making by me, whether it's dyeing or black printing or sienna type or whatever it is, or rust um, dyeing or eco printing. So, um, but I think that the twigs and the, the nature pieces often are hints, I think, at what you might be seeing in my, seeing in my work. Um, but it's, you know, it is just a, I, I don't know how in travel that we've done, I don't know how that you can possibly um, be um, in that kind of nature. I didn't want to do that. I don't know how you can possibly be around the Rocky Mountains or be at the shore and see a great sunset and not be inspired by it somehow. And for me, it comes out in my work, not everyone, but. And I'm struggling with how to get off of, there it is, stop share. Thank you. <laughs> the joys of doing something live, right? Thank you. <laughs> Dagmar, Dagmar, what about you? You mentioned how much nature influenced you, especially early on, but how do you incorporate it? What, do you, what were your influences? A lot of my work is actually informed by the American Southwest, by the landscape of the American Southwest. And I'm going to put my screen on here. Um, here's an illustration uh, from Southern Utah, the Grand Staircase Escalante. Um, as I mentioned before, one of my earlier uh, strat uh, series is called Strata. So I've always been inspired by the layers and the strata of rock and then, of course, um, the colors. And here's another picture um, of, and you will see it um, a little bit later on, my most current work in this series actually looks more like this. Um, here's another one, a slot canyon. Um, I am forever fascinated by these shapes of uh, petrified sandstone and how the water and the wind has shaped um, has shaped all of these um, um, all of these landscapes. And uh, this is one of my early strata pieces. And even though this doesn't look like anything like the landscape pictures I just showed you, it is my own feeling and inspiration that has come from seeing it in that environment, which, it, and I know that Joan and Gina know that as well, it kind of grabs your soul and your heart and you just do with it whatever you're called to do kind of and so this is um how my strata series started um of course i'm taking artistic license so the colors are more it's an exuberance that i also feel when i'm in that environment a gratitude and appreciation so i've made i think 48 pieces in this series um, in that same kind of um, in that same kind of um, pattern or manner, if if you if you wish. Um, oh, should do that. So um, I will stop here. Now, like I said, it it was obvious. Just I mean, being familiar with the work, how important nature is. What about other influences? I mean, each of you mentioned your family and the way that you grew up and where you grew up as being an influence. But are there other things that have influenced what you've done and where you've drawn inspiration? You want to go again, Joan? Or I, <laughs> Joan, you want to jump in? <laughs> I, I, I will. I, I will. You know, you're there. You go okay. ahead. Okay. Um. Yeah, I, I think that um, you know, obviously it's nature. Um, how I 
see nature is in different ways, you know, childhood and just outside when you walk outside, you know, Wisconsin, it's, it's a beautiful state, uh, of course, but, um, you know, through different travels, whether they're local, so I think travel has inspired my work. Um, okay, I'm going to try to get out there again. And um, well, we haven't gone, traveled extensively, but when we have traveled, okay, um, one of the places that we have gone a couple of times is, is Mexico, and um, the sunsets are gorgeous. You know, we, we don't see, with Lake Michigan to the east of us, we don't see the gorgeous sunsets, um, and I don't have an unobstructed morning view <laughs> um, of the lake. So the sunsets are gorgeous there. The Pacific Ocean is beautiful, and that's um, that's just part of it. Um, the whole Mexican culture, um, I just love it. For one, it's a very rich, a very textile rich culture, and um, the colors they use, and just the joy, you know, that they bring to what they do has been a big inspiration on me in the last couple of years. Um, also, um, the way that their faith infuses their way of life, not just their art and what they do. I mean, you'll be walking along the street and you see this beautiful little painting in an alcove, and it's like, who does that belong to? What did it, how did it get there? And it's a painting of Our Lady of Guadalupe, or, you know, there's just beautiful little things like that. And um, whether it's in Mexico or um, in Europe or in Ireland or, you know, wherever we've been, that kind of um, experience has really made a huge impact in the last couple of years, I think, in my work. I'm trying to see if I have, yes, maybe. Um, why can't I proceed? Okay, that's really weird. Time delay. Good grief. Now you've seen them all. <laughs> anyway, um, this is another one from the Heaven and Earth very short series I did uh, for a show at the Pink Llama Gallery in, um, in Cedarburg, um, which was last year in March, I think. And um, again, it's nature um, kind of combined with, I think, think, my faith that has inspired my work and obviously the, the title. But um, that and, again, some more local travel. This was Lake Superior. Um, it's nature, um, but not right out my door. And um, if you've been to Lake Superior, and I haven't been only a couple of times, uh, it's just different. It's gorgeous. There's a beach made out of this rhyolite pink stone that's incredibly beautiful. And um, the way the rocks tinkle when the waves hit all these little rocks on the beach make a, a different sound than they do with other kinds of stones. So they kind of call it the singing beach. And so the piece that has the hand stitched circles is supposed to kind of, it made my, it was my idea of those sounds of the singing beach. I think that's the only one I have here. Anyway, um, so yeah, it, I, so travel, my faith are also um, big parts of inspiration from, from my work. Sorry about that. Joan Dagmar, what about the, the two of you? I'm using, okay, I hear you, sorry. Oh, that was on me, I muted myself. <laughs> Joan, did you wanna go ahead? Um, I can, if you'd like. Um, I, um, a couple years back, um, well, I have a lot of different influences. It's mostly what's going on around me. And for a period of time, when my children were in, um, both in college, they both went to UWM and it seemed like we were down there constantly, um, meeting up with them, having dinner. And I was captivated by all the shapes in all the buildings and in the alleys and, um, you know, not just the, the, um, skyscrapers and all, but the old industrial sections. And um, I'm not from the, not from Wisconsin. I'm from Illinois and from Chicago suburbs. So I'm not real familiar with the industrial side of a city. Um, so it was really, it was really interesting. It was really fun. So I did 
um, a number of handbags that were um, inspired by the city of Milwaukee and by their um, uh, um, okay, come on. Where's Joey? And I'm playing with my screen here to share share with you. Um, inspired by the um, the industrial side of um, the city of Milwaukee, um, oh. I incorporated um, chains and and um, keys and nuts and uh, buttons, metal buttons that would um, look like screws. Um, and it was it was really interesting to me to make these shapes and to make handbags that just had this the heavy sturdy feel of a of a really strong building. Um, some of my sometimes I'm just inspired not by anything in particular, but I need to build a structure like a hat or a a scarf, and so it's more of a technical inspiration like how do i accomplish this thing you know what do i need to do with my pattern pieces or whatever um part of my process that you know I, i'll talk more about later but it requires that i in um predict what my materials are going to do when they're felted i make all my pieces first and then felt them so a hat is way larger than what will fit on the head. And there's a certain um, proportional shrinkage, it's not even. So I have to predict how much this thing's gonna shrink. Um, I like making purses and scarves because I don't have to worry about it fitting. A hat has to fit. So the technical challenges, they really inspire me. They really challenge me and I really enjoy that. You know, sometimes I wonder, should I have been an engineer? But then I think math and uh, then mm -hmm. I say no. We shouldn't have, but um, hey, there's still a lot of math in, some, in all of what you guys do. <laughs> true, true, but it's like oh, five eighths inch seam allowance and um, you know general fractions. It's not calculus. So anyway, um, but I I'm also really inspired by um, it doesn't come out explicitly in my work, but by spending time with artists and this experience today is just really inspiring. Seeing how other people work and how um, the thought processes that go into their work is, is inspiring to me. Taking classes from other artists, like that's how I met Gina, was taking her rust dyeing class. Um, while I generally don't take classes in my own media because they don't exist, because my processes are all my own that I've developed, um, I sometimes step out of what I usually do and, and take a class just for fun. But I find that what I've learned will inspire new ways to use my techniques. Um, the Taking a paper collage class inspired the form that my emerald ash borer piece finally took. I, like I said, I've been thinking about that for like five years and it was after taking the collage class and manipulating things that um, I understood a way to express my idea, or Gina's class kind of pointed me to shibori dyeing um, because of the way we wrap silk around uh, rusted materials. I never have done any rust dyeing since, but I did have done shibori inspired by that class. So it, it, you don't know what's going to bump you into a, a new direction. Um, so life, everything in life is an inspiration. Dagmar? Yeah, I want to echo what both Gina and Joan have said. Um, you know, being inspired uh, by, by other people, uh, being inspired by um, other parts of nature. Um, so I'm just gonna click forward here a little bit. And actually I can talk about this. I'm inspired by the scraps that I make. So by leftovers and just odds and ends. Um, oh, I love that. Okay. Um, I swear I did not coordinate this with Gina, but this is a piece that I made um, for an exhibit about Lake Superior. <laughs> current. Um, I had an exhibit a couple of years ago um, up at the um, 
Great Lakes, uh, Northern Great Lakes Visitor Center. And um, I made this for, uh, for that exhibit. So obviously inspired by Lake Superior. This piece um, was inspired by the photograph that a dear friend of mine took and shared with me um, about, it's actually, um, he took it at the Oregon coast. And, but I loved the idea of the waves rolling in and the sand and then some seaweed. Um, and uh, this work also really um, convinced me entirely that I am a hand stitcher. <laughs> so because this is a whole cloth quilt that's all hand stitched. But I want to talk a little bit about people who, uh, contemporary people who have inspired me and continue to inspire me. Dorothy Caldwell is a stitcher and mark maker and in, in cred I'm, I'm just in awe of her work. She does these huge pieces. Um, Sheila Hicks is my hero. Sheila is 85 years old now and she still works. She still makes stuff. She is a wrapper of fabric and I do that too. I, I can't show everything that I make, um, but I, I make prayer sticks that are just wrappings with, with uh, yarn and, and uh, fabric. Here's another one of Sheila's works. Um, Judy Martin is one of my favorite, favorite artists. Um, she made this uh, long piece. It's just couching on a background. And that's actually what I, what I have been doing for some time without knowing that Judy works that way. And here's a piece um, I call this to Frida with love. Um, it was made in honor of Frida Kahlo. Um, but this is all fabric couched onto a background. So those are some of my inspirations. One of the things I'm always fascinated by anytime I'm talking to an artist. So e even though you are all working in fiber, there are obviously similar inspirations for each of you. How do you work? So what's your favorite way to work at home? You know, I, I know you've got different studios. What's your studio space like? Do you have to have the TV on or radio or does it have to be quiet? So what, what works best for you when you're actually creating? Well, I need to be alone and I need to, um, if, it, if I don't have silence, I have very specific music that sets very specific moods. Um, I never realized this, and I know my sister's listening, and she's going to say, yep, but I really think that I'm ADD, um, and part of what got me so late in, in being an artist, I think, is an inability to concentrate and focus on one thing, and I have a very specific Bach piece that I put on when I come in my studio, and it, it shuts down thoughts, and it says, it's time to work. And the reason I do this is there's a bead artist named Lisa Binkley, and she lives out in the Madison area. Yeah, she's a wonderful artist. I heard her talk, and she was talking about the effect that music and podcasts had on her work. And I'm like, huh. And I started paying attention, and it's like, sure enough. So, you know, but I, I have a new dedicated space at, in my home. It's, it's two former bedrooms that have been knocked together. I've got a wet room and a dry room, and it's lovely to have dedicated spaces so you can just have your work out and work and not have to clean up one area before you jump to another thing. You know, you don't have to put everything away. Um, before I had dedicated spaces, it was a nightmare. So, um, but yeah, silence and no English lyrics when I'm concentrating. Um, <laughs> and dedicated that spaces. that way otherwise? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Well, Joan, I, I, I think if I could go next that there's no question in my mind that if I were in school now, I might have had been on the spectrum of attention deficits somewhere along the line, um, at least somewhat. But um, I am very social, so I do like to be around people, but mm -hmm. you're right, I don't get my best work done when I'm around people. 
but the way I work, and you probably too, it kind of feeds my attention issues because I will be in my basement for an hour, then I have to go up to my garage to put something in the pot, then I'll come up to my stitching area, um, and then I'll go, oh man, I've got, I kind of want to black print that, so then I head over to the arts mill, and I'll black print for an hour, and then I've got all these pieces kind of in stages, and then I will sit down, and that's when I really like to be quiet, when I sit down in my sewing room, and then I can sew. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of amazing though. I, I do find out that I get a lot of my steps in during my work because I'm constantly yeah. up and down and up and down, outside, inside, you know, gathering leaves, doing whatever. But yeah, it's so it's funny mm -hmm. to say that. <laughs> what about you, Dagmar? I'm very fortunate. Um, I have a studio away from home where I've got my sewing machine and my design wall and all of my fabric and an area for doing uh, surface design and dyeing. But I do an awful lot of work at home and, I, and that's the stitching, the hand stitching, what I can put in my lap. Um, you know, I can work at home and so I I may spend a couple of hours in the studio, but then I can still work another three or four or more hours at home with the stitching. I have to admit that I stitch a lot while I binge on streaming services. So I'm really up to date with all of that stuff. <laughs> it makes me rather prolific too. So. <laughs> That's you're you're being a lot more productive while watching that than probably a lot of us are. <laughs> yes, but for my design work and all of, really for most of my work, I'm like Joan. I like being alone. I like working alone. Um, I sometimes have the radio, um, I sometimes have NPR on um, briefly, but, and sometimes I listen to music that I choose, but I also like to have a lot of quiet. And I, I find a lot of my work is meditative, really, the stitching. And you, you know, I mean, all of you know that who've done handwork, that it, it can be very meditative. Now, one of the other things that, I mean, all three of you have talked about is dyeing your own fabrics. Um, and that's obviously something that is really important to not just the the ultimate work, but I mean, the, how your work even, how you tell your story, how you're expressing yourself. So would you tell us a, a little bit about how each of you does it? Because each of you dies, but you all do it in slightly in, in different ways. So, um, you know, Gina, maybe you want to go, you already alluded to the eagles printing and eagle dying. Um. I started out um, dyeing fabric because I wanted to have something that I could, oh, come on, something that I could sell that would be a little more quick sell at the arts mill to pay my rent. Okay, I mean, that was, you know, really it. And um, when I was teaching, we did tie dye for color mixing and had fun with that in our um, introductory art course. And I thought I can do that. So I started tie dyeing and a little bit, learned a little bit more about shibori on um, silk scarves, rayon scarves and sold those at the arts mill. Well, um, one of my um, regular customers asked me if I'd ever heard of rust dyeing. I'm like, I don't even know what that means. I mean, I know rust will make a mark. And this was years ago, probably now six or seven. And um, so I started to investigate it, and from that point on, I'm mostly self-taught with um, natural dyes and eco-printing. And as I, as you had said in my introduction, that eco-printing is really, um, it is an extension of natural dye, but instead of throwing everything in the pot and extracting color and then using that colored water to dye fabric, you're, you're doing direct contact. And the, the image here is a, um, I'm not 100% sure what those are. Um, flowers, maybe, or sumac, staghorn sumac fronds um, that were bundled onto a piece of fabric and folded into the fabric. And then on this particular piece, they were wrapped around a rusty chunk of metal. And um, then it was simmered for, I know it varies, probably at least um, 90 minutes um, 
one hour to 90 minutes. And um, when you're done, the direct contact puts the color in, um, um, in a more impressionistic way or it, depending on what it is, flowers do tend to fall apart like the pinks and purples on here, but leaves, because of the structure of the leaf, um, you often get a print and you'll see the form of that leaf. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of variety. You can see my, when uh, that Lake Superior trip, my cousin and his wife, we did a, a little private workshop and she's laying the leaves out on a, a silk wool blend scarf in the garage and then we were gonna steam it this time. So you have to apply steam or, um, or simmer it to get that transfer to happen. And um, really, you know, that's, that also led me to a little bit of dyeing, a natural dye as well. Why doesn't that one go to the next slide? Okay, that's so weird, sorry. Now I went three again. I apologize. <laughs> Shoot. Um, I think I'm here. Yes. And you'll see some of the leaves coming off. I'm unrolling. In that core um, that that scarf happens to be is wrapped around is probably a chunk of wood. Um, we have a lot of um, arborvita on our yard and a lot of them, you know, have been trimmed and my husband has a real good idea of what exactly I want that'll fit in my cooker and um, the diameter I need. And so that was wrapped around that. And then the uh, image on the right is a, a finished product that's a silk wool scarf that was eco printed and nothing else, just eco printing. Um, but I have also, this is so weird, I can't seem to. Oh, I apologize. Well, I also have, um, why is it doing that? I also have over dyed or dyed first. This is cochineal. The pink is a natural cochineal dye with eco printing over the top of it. And then the image on the left is again, straight eco printing on um, uh, silk charmousse, I think. So, um, you know, that, that kind of mark making, I'll use that term again, is something that I, I really enjoy doing. And um, that process is, um, well, it's, it's credited by a few people, but is in the natural dye field, uh, India Flint is really one of the people that most people give credit to developing it. Um, I just, um, I downloaded a video, I paid for an online class with Kathy Hayes out of Florida, and I learned the basics from her introductory video, and then it was just trial and error. You know, it's, my plants are different than the plants in Florida, and your plants are different even in Washington County, depending on the type of soil that the tree is in. And you know, that if you pick your leaves in um, July, it's gonna be different than if you pick up the leaves that have fallen in October. So um, eco printing is a lot of trial and error, and. Um, and it's serendipitous. You have to, like John was with the hats, you, there is knowledge-based guessing involved, you know, but, um, but it's fun. Um, and that's the most different type of dyeing that I do. I use cyanotype and other um, coloring of fabrics, but discharged paste and things like that. But, but the eco printing is um, what is really most people associate with my work. And you'll see it in, in most of the, my pieces, at least a little bit. Uh, Dagmar, what, Dagmar, what about you? Um, I usually, uh, I mostly use commercial dyes, uh, Procyon MX dyes. And uh, let me just pull up. Oops, sorry. Um, but uh, I do a lot of different types of uh, surface design, uh, printing. Oh, here are, some, I make my own print plates. So here are, here's an assortment of some print plates that I've used. Um, here is um, a piece of cotton velveteen that I have printed uh, with, um, with my 
print plates. Here is an original print on cotton. Um, and then, of course, I just do also plain immersion dyeing. This is, uh, to the left, you see a piece of the, uh, silk velvet that's immersion dyed. And then on the right, the caption here is incorrect. It's silk chiffon. It's a shibori dyed a piece of silk. I've also been rusting. Um, I have, you name it, I've, I've tried it. The only thing I don't like to do is the really time consuming Japanese methods of resist dyeing and, and various other things. So um, this is mostly what I do. Although I have also taken the same, uh, classes in, in botanical dyeing. Joan, what about you? Well, well, actually, I have to say this is really exciting because now I have two resources that I'm going to be going to with my dyeing questions as I try and expand some of my dyeing techniques. Um, I mostly use um, acid wash fiber reactive dyes, um, chemical dye like Dagmar does. Um, I started, when I first started doing my work, the, there were a lot of um, because I'm using recycled sweaters, there are a lot of patterned fabrics available. And it was actually the patterns from the fabrics that um, I, I used to inspire my designs. Um, it would be like, I have this sweater with, this, with these characteristics. What's the best use for those characteristics in what I'm trying to make? And that was the fun and the challenge of what I had been doing. But then eventually the, the sources for those fabrics dried up for a number of reasons. Um, most of them are in people's closets they bought to make things out of and never did because they tell me about it all the time when I meet them at art fairs. Um, so I, um, I was also dissatisfied with, you know, the colors of ready-made um, clothing. They, you know, a green sweater, Kelly green sweater is not the color of a leaf. Um, it doesn't have the, the sparkle and, and flicker that uh, a leaf in the sunlight has. So I took an over dyeing class at Fiberwood Studio in Milwaukee, and it, it really changed my practice. Um, and at the same time, I had moved out of my fractured um, workspaces in our home into a, a dedicated space in downtown West Bend that had a huge room with a big table where I could lay everything out on, and it was absolutely glorious. Um, so I, I do actually, and I'm talking, and I'm forgetting. The pictures. Um, here we go. Just try to move one forward. Um, here's some different types of of dyeing um, that I'll do. Um, I'm gonna move you guys out of the way. I mostly mix the dyes and then paint them on my fabrics. Um, the the way the dye works is you need to pre-soak your fabric in an acid solution to prepare it um, to accept the dyes. So I mostly I work with my fabrics when they're wet. Um, on the the um, left hand side, I'm painting the dye onto a cashmere scarf, and then I'll you work the dye like a watercolor, where I move it from side to side uh, so the colors flow together. Um, generally, I don't have just uncolored fabric to work on. I'm usually dying on colors. So it's, it's interesting to try and predict um, how is this particular green going to look on say this blue or this green or this yellow fabric that I'm working with. Um, in the center is a group of um, what I call blanks. And these are fabrics, they're parts of sweaters that I've cut apart and then I'll dye them with um, paint them with um, the different colors. Some are more random than others. Um, what you see, there's a little strip hanging there that's like green and pink on um, yellow. Those are spots that's, um, I'm losing my words, um, specifically designated. I'm going to cut that up into um, flower petals. So sometimes it's a random look I'm after. Sometimes it's, it's I have a a specific use where I want to create some flower petals that I want the colors to be in general areas. Um, I'll also sprinkle dye, which is what you see up in the top 
um, right there with the green and the orange. Actually, that's lime, cantaloupe, and watermelon colored dye. Um, I just texted it. Yeah. Oh. Um, um, uh, sprinkling the dye is fun because dye powders are not necessarily all one color. Uh, so when you sprinkle the powder, it breaks up into its components and, and you get really interesting color interactions that flow together. Um, or as the, what you see on that leaf, um, that's two pieces that have been sewn together. The um, vein of the leaf is a separate fabric, but the top, the blue and kind of yellowish areas were dyed as a piece um, with, the, again, the dye in specific areas um, because I was intending to use that as a, a little cabbage leaf um, picture. So it's, it's really, to, to be able to use dyes really revolutionized my work and has allowed me to really develop my, um, my work into what it has become. Now, um, we got a question asking, where can we find out, find more of your work? So, you know, Gina, I know you've had different things here in at the museum um, and in the gift shop. Dagmar, I think you currently have things um, for sale in the gift shop. Joan, you were mentioning a sale that you just made um, <laughs> when we were doing the, the training that was at the Museum of Wisconsin mm -hmm. Art. But where else, if, if people are looking for your work, where can they, where can they find it? And, you know, feel free to selflessly promote here. Um, so, uh, you know, I know each of you has websites. So we, as you say it off, we can actually type it into the chat um, as well. Okay. I'm also on uh, Facebook and Instagram, so people can personal message me. Yep, yep. Um, I, I'm also represented by the Pink Llama Gallery in uh, Seaburg, Wisconsin. Um, she has some of my uh, textile collage, and um, Tammy is the really outside of my studio at the Arts Mill in Grafton. Um, outside of that, she's really the only place you can find my scarves. So, is it the um, Mine, um, my website is, is Joan Kennedy Art, um, or Art, singular, joankennedyart.com. And you'll find a link or a page on there that has my galleries and show schedules there. Uh, currently, my all my art fairs for the year, um, for the summer, have been canceled. Um, I do have two coming up, one in um, October in Door County in Sister Bay, and then in November in Madison. I really prefer selling my work in person because I feel people need to touch it. So I haven't pursued you know, an online shopping platform. Um, so if you do go to my website, most of the things you'll see there have been sold. Um, but you can check my um, show schedule page. I also have work at the Museum of Wisconsin Art. It's a limited um, selection right now of um, some houses that I've built um, that were inspired by the um, coronavirus uh, situation and um, I also have work right now at a gallery in um, Mineral Point. Um, uh, I can't think of the name of it. It's on my website. Anyway, um, so that's where you can find my work. You can always email me and ask what I might have on hand. Now, ladies, believe it or not, our time is just about up. <laughs> so I, it, it was kind of fun when we originally started chatting about this. Remember, I sent you this long list of, you know, these are all the different things. I'm like, we're going to go through this. It, the hour is going to go by so fast. And that's exactly what's happened. Um, so final thoughts, um, final things that you guys would like to share with everybody. Uh, and just so you know, we did get a, a comment on Facebook calling, saying you ladies are so inspiring. So, um, you know, it sounds like you're inspiring one another too, but you're inspiring those that are hearing. So final thoughts, final ideas, you know, comments that you want to share? Well, you know, I think Joan just mentioned, I can't believe first time the coronavirus in our talk here today, but um, it's really, it was difficult to work. And I think for me, um, but once I got going, um, mm -hmm. I started uh, a project I've been wanting to do for months and that was to make my own prayer flags and once I got started with them they were small I could see the finish I liked doing it and now I just finished my 20th one and about halfway through 
um, the um, George Floyd, I don't know what to call it, incidents, trauma um, for our country happened in all the other inequalities tended to surface and um, it just seemed like there was more and more need for me to think about it and process it and I did that through my work and um, I don't know if we have time to share those today but um, maybe when I was talking I could but that has been um, huge for me as far as what I've how I've been able to process it and um, they're not joined together yet um, but I tried you know I kept thinking about not just my faith but the world and that we are one world and so I've tried to infuse um, without overreaching um, some other cultures and faiths um, in it and uh, although you'll see most of them are are mine um, there's actually in the last one shoot yeah this is the center one is a african adrinka um, nurturing symbol um, i took i was ha uh, happy to take a open studio with ariana comer at the linden sculpture garden last summer and we did some batik so that was really neat and she had tons of symbols and so that was with that and um, the stitching has been meditative as uh, dagmar had talked about um, the centerpiece here is um, inspired from the Native American trip that I took with our youth group, church youth group, uh, many summers ago, uh, the Four Directions. And that centerpiece is a chunk from the Pipestone uh, Park in um, southwestern uh, Minnesota that my son brought me back, um, what that peace pipes are actually made out of. And then lastly, you know, Our Lady of Guadalupe, as I'd mentioned before, is an inspiration. and. Um, um, those are just a few of them, but um, I hope to um, decide. I'm not sure what it's going to be, for, um, but I think I will do some of them together. But I might just, I might just um, set them up, maybe even frame them singly, because um, they are pretty different. But it's been a huge lifesaver for me to do that, and I think that we all can experience that with our work. Final thoughts? Yeah. yeah, I um, also had a, um, I, I moved back into my, uh, my studio back home just as the shutdown orders happened, like literally that week. And oh, wow. I was, I was really pleased to, to be home, have everything in one spot again. Um, and I was planning on doing, like starting to do some hand stitch work. And I did do some of it. And I, I, I wasn't happy with my results and I wasn't, it wasn't as satisfying as, as I had thought. And I was kicking around and I was thinking, and it, yes, I'm so delighted with where I'm living now and with having my studio at home. And then hearing about so many people, you know, being stuck at home, having to learn to work from home, teaching their kids while they're trying to work, trying to stay safe, people who, um, maybe were at home with an abuser without that outlet of home of school or work and and people who were homeless and the shelters are no longer safe because they're too crowded and and so then they're on the street but then they're not safe because how do you wash your hands when you're living on the street and then i'm thinking about what about people who are by themselves in their home and separated from their communities of their heart and so I, I conceived of this idea to make these little houses. And they, they open up, and I'm getting, I'm getting emotional just talking about them. Inside of each one is a little cashmere heart. And they're just, you know, I, I intentionally made the windows bright as like a beacon of light. And just putting these out there kind of as a wish for people um, that they would find some safety and some kind of a home. So these are at the Museum of Wisconsin Art right now. Um, actually, the little house sold, um, but I did happen to make two similar, the, the little tree house, the two similar, they're not identical, um, and that one is over there now too. So um, that was my, my COVID experience and where I go from here, I don't know, I don't know. It's not over.
No, no. I think we're I think we're all kind of wondering that question right now. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. Uh, keep yeah. making houses, Joan. They're beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. And Dagmar, what about you? Final thoughts? Um, I picked up uh, on a series, on my Strata series um, that I had showed earlier, and, um, oops, hmm. oh, here we go, I'm sorry, um, just want to go real quick here, we didn't get to our series. Um, but this is what I uh, picked up on. I felt called to continue in that series, but in a really, really different way with a lot of hand stitching and very much uh, showing the rock and the, um, the, the strata and the, like the slot canyon kind of area. So that's what I've been working on during this time. They're really interesting, Dagmar. Thank you. I like the textures. And again, you know, thank you all so much. That that is our hour, believe it or not. <laughs> so thank you for having us. Yes, it was wonderful. Thank and you, it was, Melissa. Yeah. It was good seeing you guys. You too. Hope and to see you soon in person. Both. For those of you who um, have tuned in today, if you enjoyed it, the museum would greatly appreciate it if you'd be willing to make a donation. Any amount is appreciated. We, you can go to our website, um, or which is wiquotemuseum.com. We'll post the information in the chat feature. Uh, you can donate through PayPal, or you can also donate direct to this, this program. But the museum has been doing these programs. We actually started, believe it or not, Back in on April 3rd, we, we held our first one. We've been doing them ever since. And we really appreciate all of the support that we've gotten. Uh, the donations that you're making allow us to continue doing these. So um, please do, and please tune in. Our next one will be uh, Treasures from the Vault. So we have um, an exhibit coming up, the Quarantine Quilt exhibit coming up. And part of the gallery will be split, so it'll actually feature some of our favorite pieces from the museum's collection. And we'll be doing a special talk on that one on July 24th. So tune in, That's, that'll be our next Friday lunchtime chat. And thank you all very much. And we appreciate you joining us today. Thank you for the opportunity, Melissa. Thank you very much. So nice to see you.